Mr. Marikan, thank you for taking the time to do this interview. Um, this is part of a larger project by ICUR concerning Armenia and Azerbaijan and the relations in between. So um, the trilateral agreement has stabilized the situation to a certain extent. What could destabilize this agreement, the ceasefire? Azerbaijan uh, argues there are many, many statements during these days that they don't have any POWs in Azerbaijani prisons. But we know, and a lot of human rights organizations report it as well, uh, through Red Cross channels as well, that we have more than about 200 POWs in Azerbaijani prisons. So European Court of Human Rights adopted several interim measures decisions against Azerbaijan to allow access to see these people in Azerbaijani prisons, to return them to Armenia, to not torture them. And right now we have a case when a confirmed POW was killed in Azerbaijan and we got a body. So the, 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 two or three weeks ago, um, there was a funeral of this film. Uh, the Armenian uh, soldier. So what I'm going to say that in this situation, we have right now destabilization. It's not a stable situation. The other thing is that Azerbaijani president Ilham Aliyev just uh, a week ago did a statement that they call all international investors to invest in Armenian Sunni region in Zangezur which is claiming that it's Azerbaijani historic lands. So first of all, it's total lie. It's not Azerbaijani historic land, but he is calling international investors to invest in Armenia, in Armenian sovereign territory, which is Sunni region, you know, which is nothing to do with Nagorno-Karabakh. So this is also a destabilizing thing. And on daily basis, they are converting Armenian churches in the lands that they occupied right now, Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh lands under the Azerbaijani control. And they are claiming that this is Albanian uh, heritage. This is, uh, I don't know what heritage, but this is not Armenian. They are uh, taking out all crosses from, from uh, churches. And you know, this kind of uh, cultural genocide is also happening right now there. And the people here are very angry very disappointed of the whole process. So we thought that, um, okay, it was a war. So it was a big defeat for us. But, but uh, after the signing this kind of document, I, after giving up everything, what is going to happen? So these things that we see that uh, these statements, uh, ignorance, you know, hatred, aminophobic statements on daily basis in different uh, levels. So we uh, we say that you must uh, give us back uh, Armenian POWs. They argue that, you know what, uh, we want a peace with you. We want a peace. Why you are destabilizing? So we ask just POWs, which is according to the November 9 document, a statement, which is signed by Russia, by Azerbaijan, by Armenia. So even we have women, women POWs in Azerbaijani prisons, they were tortured. So they released one of them, uh, Maral. Uh, she's now in Beirut, in Lebanon, because she was a Lebanese citizen as well. But her husband is in Azerbaijani prison. So they released her first. So, and they keep her husband as a hostage to not allow her to tell the international community, the people, what was happening in Azerbaijani prisons. So now she says, so the treatment was good, everything was good, but the treatment was very bad. Even we have reports that uh, uh, women were uh, reportedly, you know, raped and uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, um, mass human rights violations happened there. And on the other hand, you know, we got bodies. Uh, the most of the bodies are beheaded. So they cut heads. And uh, there are reports that uh, Syrian mercenaries that were fighting from Azerbaijan side, they were uh, paid by heads of soldiers. So they were killing soldiers and then beheading them and then bringing uh, the, the heads of the soldiers to their, uh, you know, to their chiefs who were ordering this uh, inhuman, degrading and genocidal uh, policies that they were on ground during the war. 
So this was not Azerbaijan only. This is uh, Turkish Azeri aggression, uh, together with uh, paid mercenaries from Syria and some other countries as well. There are many, many reports about it. So uh, coming back to your question, so what will destabilize the situation? I will argue and I will assure you that the situation is not stable. So, and the, the statements, the behavior, uh, whatever happening right now is destabilizing and it's one-sided, just Azerbaijani side is doing on daily basis. I understand. Um, so Russia that um, facilitated this trilateral agreement, how do you evaluate their role in this conflict? So uh, if not Russia, let's say, so Azerbaijan will occupy Stepanakert and other parts of the Nagorno-Karabakh Hesma. So, and there will be a genocide, totally genocide. So this was attempt of the genocide, I could say. And uh, what they argue always, they want a lens without people, just lens without Armenians, lens without people. So this ethnic cleansing policy going on and, and, and what is happening uh, right now, we can say that if not Russian peacekeepers there, so the war will re uh, resume and they will uh, uh, continue their aggression, not only against uh, uh, Stepanakert and Nagorno-Karabakh territories, but to the Armenian territories as well, because they just now speaking about Tunic region and calling international investors to come and it's crazy. I mean, it's, I don't understand how this can happen. And 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 uh, we highly appreciate Russian role and Russian peacekeepers' uh, operations right now. And I hope uh, they will remain there until Nagorno-Karabakh status is not is not decided and the conflict is not resolved. So otherwise, otherwise the uh, the big war will start again. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Markey, on your party, Bright Armenia, is a proponent of strengthening Armenia's connections to the European Union. What role does the EU play right now? And in your opinion, what could it play? So uh, European Union, uh, I could say, uh, I, I'm saying this, you know, with a big disappointment, it was very passive during the war, it was very passive. Uh, uh, only France was active, the President Macron, but EU as institution, EU as institution was very passive. And, and right now I see the role of the European Union. First of all, humanitarian role. So you know Armenia is in deep humanitarian crisis. We have more than 16,000 16, refugees from Nagorno-Karabakh. Nobody talks about it. Nobody speaks about these issues. We are in a social, economical, humanitarian, and as political as well crisis because we were in a deep crisis because of the COVID pandemic. And then the war, you know, started. And then after war, we have thousands of people who are, who, who, who are in need, you know, of uh, medical aid. Uh, they lost their parts of the bodies and, and, and uh, Armenia alone cannot deal with this issue. It's a very big issue. It's a very big humanitarian crisis. And, and uh, I think European Union can, can help, first of all, in humanitarian level. Second, uh, France as a EU member state and a very important uh, player in the European Union is a OSC means group uh, chairman country. And I think OSC means group uh, co-chairman uh, must be very active in this, in this stage, uh, forcing Azerbaijan to implement the November 9 statement, first of all. Second, for Nagorno-Karabakh uh, status, the final status is not decided yet. So the document of the November 9 is not uh, talking in any way about the status of the Nagorno-Karabakh. So this is unresolved. So, and European Union uh, on behalf of France, let's say, has a big role there. So Russian Federation, France, and United States stated several times that OSCE means group must continue. Uh, their work and, and, and um, their role is very important. And I hope that the negotiations will be activated. So President Ali of Azerbaijan stating all the time that uh, the 
problem, the conflict of Nagorno-Karabakh is solved. So and they, they say, you always claim that there is no solution by force. Now we did it. So the solution uh, happened and uh, implemented by force. So we solved the issue. But I assure you, the, the issue is not solved. The status is not, is not uh, decided yet. The people are in a desperate need of uh, solution. And they are very disappointed of the international community, which uh, was not active. And this was a blind eye, you know, like the killing people, you know, behaving people, civilians. A lot of reports. I can send you a lot of videos when they're behaving uh, old men, civilian, uh, in Shushi. You know, I mean, it's crazy things happening. But nobody says anything. In a situation when, when Azerbaijan is a member of the Council of Europe, is a member of the Council of Europe. We are not talking about ISIS type of the, you know, quasi state or ISIS type of uh, issues. So the, 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 the war, 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 war crimes were all about uh, ISIS type uh, warfare uh, that were uh, operating against uh, aggression against Azerbaijan, against Nagorno Karabakh by Azerbaijan and Turkey and with, together with mercenaries. Mm -hmm. Um, to come back, you mentioned the political crisis in Armenia. As you know, at the beginning of March, protesters have shortly taken over a government building in Yerevan. Can you give me a short assessment of um, the situation and what led to this um, crisis? Sure. You know, uh, after the November 9 ceasefire agreement or statement, let's say, uh, I think all Armenian parties demanded resignation of the prime minister. So, and, and there was a roadmap, uh, roadmap released by Bright Armenian Party, by our party, on November 14, that we were proposing the resignation of the uh, prime minister and then electing a transitional prime minister by the parliament, uh, even from the ruling party. And then uh, stabilizing country, uh, dealing with all humanitarian crises and issues that we have right now. And then after six months or a year, organize a, parliamentary elections. So we could say snap elections to so, you know, uh, parliamentary elections. And, and, uh, but, uh, and uh, many other forces you know, de demanded the same. So I, I was and I'm still a candidate for the prime minister. And there is another candidate from the prime minister from other forces, uh, which is a former prime minister of Armenia. So, and uh, now we or the other forces, we were not successful in this in this case. And the prime minister didn't resign until now we are in a deep crisis. And what happened, we were uh, now lobbying for, for uh, elections without any preconditions. Because what, whatever we said in November or in December is not actual now. And, and the crisis is deepening and deepening and there's no way out of this crisis. So that is why we decided that even if the incumbent prime minister will be the organizer of the elections, which is a lot of forces are against, we are okay for this, but the elections must uh, be organized very soon. Like if the prime minister will resign before April 6, we will have elections uh, uh, during the May, May month. So uh, it, is, it is the fastest version that we can do that. Uh, according to our constitution. If not, so then uh, the crisis uh, will, will be uh, going on and I don't know what will happen. There are streets closed in the city, in Yerevan. On daily basis, there are civil disobedience uh, actions in Yerevan or in regions. And uh, I could say that state institutions are not well uh, operated because of this crisis. I understand. Um... Thank you very much. Is there anything you would like to add? Uh, thank you so much. And I, I would like to uh, uh, send a message to all our international partners uh, using this opportunity. I call all our partners to help Armenia, to stand with Armenia, to help Armenian people in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, because they are in desperate need of humanitarian uh, help. And on the other hand, of security because a lot of people lost their husbands, brothers, fathers, even sisters, and they have no information whether they are POWs, 
or civilian captives or they are dead. There's no information and people you know, are, you know, are in very, very difficult situation. So this is my call to pressure Azerbaijan to give up uh, all preconditions and return Armenian POWs and civilians from Azerbaijani prisons, which is according to international humanitarian law, international customary law, and according to November 9 statement signed by Azerbaijani president, by Russian president and by Armenian prime minister. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you, thank you, Max.